Thank you, Dr. Primack. Uh, appreciate that very much. Um, I'm officially resisting the opportunity to note that I have clearly missed a uh, marketing opportunity for a book of my own. <laughs> Looking forward to checking out your book, sir. Uh, next, I'd like to welcome uh, uh, John Scanlon to the stage. John is the Habitat Program Supervisor at Massachusetts Division of Fisheries and Wildlife with over 30 years of experience in the department. He's a long history of work in the environmental services industry. He is professionally skilled in forestry, wildlife management, ecological restoration, wetlands, natural resource management, and environmental awareness. Starting as a forester in the Massachusetts Division of Fisheries and Wildlife, Mr. Scanlon now leads the assessment and prioritization of state wildlife lands for active management of grassland, shrubland, and forest habitats, completes habitat site plans for individual properties, and prepares and administers contracts for management actions. Mr. Scanlon also assists with land acquisition and provides technical assistance to private and public landowners while conduct conducting public outreach for management activities and monitoring management impacts. His talk this morning is titled Evaluating Success of Monitoring for impacts of climate change on state wildlife lands in Massachusetts. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Scanlon. Thank you for the, for the introduction, and uh, thanks to Dr. Pimmett for his talk. Uh, we didn't only really coordinate, but uh, a couple of the recommendations that he had about going back in time to look at older data, I'm going to take him up on, on that. So I was a good student. I, I, I paid attention. I want, want that, that, that being, being later. All right, what we're going to do today is um, three main things. Uh, since we're going to talk about monitoring, monitoring impacts of management, uh, we need to talk about what we're managing for in the first place. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on that. What I'm going to focus on is environmental stressors, okay? Obviously, we're all here thinking about climate change today, but that is not the only stressor that's out there. So we want to, uh, I'm going to ask you to step back with me a little bit to think about uh, stressors that we've been dealing with long before we were thinking about climate change. And once we have that laid out, get into what kind of monitoring do you put in place to assess impacts of climate change, to assess whether or not your management is being successful in the face of climate change. Okay, so this is what we have to manage in, in, in Massachusetts. This is a, um, uh, a pie chart of the, our state wildlife action plan swap habitats in, for the state. Uh, this is all undeveloped lands in Massachusetts. Obviously, we're heavily forested, just like we are here in, in, in Vermont. Forest lands are going to make up over 80% of the undeveloped lands in, in, in Massachusetts. One thing I'd like you to note is that statewide, over on the right-hand side, uh, young forest and shrubland habitats, which is one of our primary habitat goals in the state, are uh, pretty pretty short supply in Massachusetts these days. A hundred years ago, it certainly wasn't that way. But this is sort of the landscape setting in Massachusetts. Here are the landscape goals for state wildlife lands in Massachusetts, about 220,000 acres. And I'm not going to get into where these goals came from, except to say that they're based on literally hundreds of peer-reviewed uh, scientific papers, and that's a whole other presentation. I will say that they are adaptive and that they have changed over time, all right? But if you look at the right-hand bar, this is where we would like to be with, uh, you know, 20, 25% of our land base in some kind of open habitat condition, grassland, shrubland, young forest habitat, at any given point in time, we want the great majority of our lands to be in a full canopy forest state. And we also have a, a, a goal to um, have some you know, biologically mature, old growth type, uh, type, type forest. And so the middle bar is, is an indication of where we are now. We, uh, we manage two to 3,000 acres a year in the state. 
the point being that we're still a long way from where we would like to, to be. And this is just a little bit of information on those different, uh, these are very general habitat categories, but again, this is based on literally hundreds of peer-reviewed uh, articles. This is what we feel we need to move towards to maintain viable populations of all native wildlife species in Massachusetts. And a little bit more information is in each of those general categories on the left, you can think of there's actually a, a full range, but there's both dry sites and wet sites for all of those, all right? So if you read through this chart, these are examples of the sort of total different uh, kind of habitat diversity that we're trying to put in place and maintain you know, on, uh, on the landscape. So this is just focusing in on that, uh, that's the, the, the small portion of open habitats. What we'd like for grassland, shrubland, and, and, and young forest, okay? And you can see where we were in 2001 and, and 2016, still a ways from where we would like, where we would like to be. And the thing we're here to think about today is, as we put this management in place, what do we need to do to adapt to impacts of climate change? How can we uh, make sure we're going to be successful in our management in the face of climate change? This is just a, a give you an example. This is just last year's data. This is the range of uh, types of management activities that we put in place on the ground to uh, achieve those different habitat types. And um, the, um, uh, the, we're focused today on the more forested portions, the tree clearing, the tree mulching, and, and, and mowing. Um, we know that those activities release carbon, right? And we're gonna talk a, a lot more about that when we get into the, into the monitoring part. So this is what we're managing for. And now, um, well, just to go quick, quickly through uh, the steps we take to put management in place. Uh, the first step is really critical is assessing what natural community types you have. This is some, somewhat analogous to a forest cover type, which I know most of you here are familiar with, but it's got a lot more detail to it. And just the, the best example I can think of is that if most of you in here would have a good idea of what I would say if we were in a mixed oak forest, okay, mixed oak hardwood forest. You know, at the natural community level in Massachusetts, the heritage people have identified 10 unique you know, recurrent assemblages involving oak forest. So you really need to know, before you begin any management, what community type you're in. And again, today we're focused pretty much on the, on the terrestrial communities. All right, so we've got to determine our natural community type. Uh, can't emphasize enough thinking a lot about your desired future condition. Exactly where do you want to go? to provide that range of habitats that we looked at earlier. And then you've got a, 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 all kinds of sites to work on, 220,000 acres of state wildlife lands in Massachusetts. What's the priority? Is, is place A more important than place B? You really need to have um, good, uh, good agreement on, on prioritization. Conducting initial monitoring before any active management is put in place just can't be overstated. In fact, we'll get to it in a little bit that we're actually really uh, beefing up the, the initial monitoring because of things like trying to put climate change adaptation in place. Okay, after you get all that done, you begin your formal planning. Okay? And uh, we're looking at those three different major habitat types that we're after, fine tuning our desired future condition for each of those. If it's a fire dependent uh, type of habitat, you need to do some additional planning, prescribed fire planning. And then you get into environmental permitting, and there's lots of environmental permitting when you get to manage public lands in, in, in Massachusetts. It uh, takes quite a bit of our time, actually, but we do it and then you start to put your management contracts together, put them out to bid, get management on, on the ground. 
Okay, so what about the environmental stressors? Climate change, obviously. What I want you to do is uh, bear with me and think about 20, 30 years ago, <laughs> climate change was not something that uh, a room full of natural resource professionals would be talking about, right? Here, you, today, you, you, really, you really can't, can't escape it. So we're gonna spend some time talking about a few of these. Uh, a big one that we tend to overlook is what humans did to the landscape in terms of land use change. We all know the general story, major deforestation, agricultural conversion, subsequent abandonment. Now that is an environmental stressor, and we'll look at that in more detail here in a minute. You may remember acid rain? Boy, when I was a kid, it was like we were all going to be destroyed by acid rain. You know, what's happened, what's happened with that? And I, I couldn't resist putting invasive organisms and deer herbivory on the same line. I see a couple of people nodding out, uh, out there because um, it, it, uh, this can be a really devastating one-two punch that we'll talk about here in a little bit. All right. And oh, oh, and climate change, okay? As if we didn't have enough to deal with, all right? Now we've got to uh, factor in climate change and how does it interact with all of these previous stressors that we were already dealing with. You know, it didn't really need this headache. And as Dr. Pinnock pretty, uh, pretty well laid out for us, the, the major things we're looking at here in terms of forest management is shifts in growing season, shifts in the uh, form and amount of precipitation. Those can be, create huge, huge management issues. Um, anybody who has, uh, I'd like to see a quick show of hands. Just bear, bear with me, I'm, I'm getting old. So you know, you gotta treat, treat your elders with respect. How many people in here, please raise your hand if you have not read this paper. If you have not read this paper, okay? Please, I can't give orders, but please. This is a fine piece of ecological scholarship, all right? Challenge yourself to not only read this, but read it like line for line, not just the abstract. But the reason I'm, I'm, I want to use it today is uh, this paper talks about this discrete tension zone that formerly existed between American beech dominated northern hardwood forest all right, and oak dominated central hardwood forest. All right. These are some graphics uh, from this paper and so that term discrete tension zone you can see it here looking at oak, okay? Looking at hemlock, it's very, very much the same type of picture, okay? And then, oh, I'm sorry, this is, this is, this is beach up, up, up here, American beach on, on the upper left, all right? So this is saying that in here, prior to European settlement, you didn't see beach in that part, on all, all this part of Massachusetts. You folks in, in Vermont uh, didn't have a lot of oak, okay? And this is what uh, the authors mean when they talk about a discrete transition zone. So a lot of information on this slide, but just notice that there's two, ba two basic color patterns here, all right? Uh, the, the, the reds are, are more of the northern hardwoods, the yellows are more of the central hardwoods. Oak, okay, and the um, the occurrence was so um, whoops was so uh, consistent that it's really reflected in this um, this ecological province line between eastern broadleaf forest and uh, well it's called the New England Adirondack province but that's your northern hardwood forest okay so this is the discrete transition that Cogbear et al. talked about. And that was in place for centuries, multiple centuries. And then what happened? 
like we, we arrived, right? And it's like land clearing and agricultural conversion. Think of that as a two colored quilt on your bed. And then we came along and we just disrupted that forest cover, shook that quilt, all right? And an important point to remember is that quilt is still settling. It is not settled completely yet because that kind of disruption to a, to a system that was in place for multiple centuries uh, doesn't happen all at once. But it's settling and this is how it's settling. All right. Uh, this is a, a map of current generalized of forest types, right? And if you think about where that discrete transition zone was, we're on one side of a hill, you know, you have that American beach dominated forest. You go not too far, 50, 100 miles, and you are into the central uh, oak forest. Now that's a big transition hardwood white pine. A lot, way more white pine in the landscape than there was uh, uh, originally, okay? Um, one thing I want to point out that we're going to talk about in a bit is, is pitch pine, which occurred on, on the Cape, and that there, there was actually more of it. This is, this is another good read, really hot off the press, okay? Feb February 1935. Hey, that's, that's even older than I am. And, uh, but still uh, very applicable. So again, if you haven't read this one, please get it and, and, and look at it. But here's the pitch pine. But look where else it was. Look at, look at this, okay? That's the city of Springfield, the city of Chicopee, Westover Air Force Base, okay? These sandy outwash plains make great places to, to, to develop, right? Um, so anyway, here, here we are again, and now just to finalize this point, I'm going to overlay that original discrete transition zone, okay, in the green. So this was beech dominated northern hardwoods, this was oak dominated, you know, and what, as that quilt, that forest quilt is now settling back on the bed, back on the landscape, what happened to that discrete transition zone that occurred for multiple centuries? It's been obliterated, and we did that. All right, agricultural conversion and subsequent uh, uh, abandonment. So in terms of environmental stressors, this is one that is still ongoing. All right? The settling uh, is, is, uh, is an enduring process, let's put it, put it that way. Okay, acid rain, when I was a kid I thought I was, I couldn't go outside in the rain because I was just going to get melted, right? Uh, you're all probably relatively familiar with this, but it's actually uh, the start of a pretty major success story. The concerns raised by scientists, a lot of conservationists, foresters included, all right, led to the big progress with the 1990 uh, Clean Air Act. All right, and because researchers do a good job of communicating the nasty things that acid rain does to the environment. All right, um, you can just read read through them, and this is just sort of the, the tip of the iceberg, if if you will. But the 1990 Clean Air Act largely uh, came as a result of this. All right, and here's the headline today. All right. Some good work that's being done right, right, right here in Vermont. Right, red spruce, which is one of the major species that was uh, negatively impacted by acid rain, is actually rebounding now. But if you look at the climate change materials, red spruce along with sugar maple are some of the species that are most thought to going to be be, be imperiled in the, a future under a, a warming climate. Right. Uh, so this is uh, this is it right here. Truer words were never spoken, but they could be vulnerable to change in the future. I've never I've never uh, met Paul, but uh, I think he must be a pretty savvy fellow because that truer words were were, were were never spoken. 
invasive organisms, all right? Invasive species, but it's not just plants, it's not just insects, all right? I just decided to highlight one that we don't generally talk about, all right? The, the pilgrims brought earthworms with them, you know, buying plant material from overseas, you get soil, you get worms, all right? Uh, they have much bigger impact on our forest ecosystems than most of us really realize. Uh, sugar maple, for example, is a species that I've read has a really difficult time regenerating once these different earthworms get into an area. Now, sugar maple is also predicted to be suffering as a result of climate change because of changing moisture regimes and such. So if you're having trouble regenerating sugar maple, is it climate change? Is it earthworms? How do you tease those uh, apart? So these are a, a, a list of uh, some of the negative things that uh, most people have a good good impression of earthworms, right? They're, if you out in your garden, oh, there's earthworms in my garden, that's a good thing. Well, yeah, in a vegetable garden, it is a good thing. But our forest, it's not a good thing, all right? And so this has been an environmental special that was introduced in 1620 and has been and persisted and way really predates uh, any concerns about how do we deal with climate change. Okay, <laughs> white-tailed deer uh, can have such a major impact, all right? This is a, a, a look at, at, at Massachusetts where deer densities stand relative to target, all right? One of my first jobs for the agency was to work with a group in the Quabbin Reservoir, which is zone six, all right? that uh, honey was excluded from when the reservoir was created in the 1930s. And by the 1980s, all you had in the industry was Japanese barberry, right? And there was a very contentious effort to uh, get deer hunting established in the Quabbin Reservation. But I will never forget, three or four years after we finally got it through, and dealt with the death threats and all that kind of thing, that. Bruce Spencer, who was the chief forester for Quabbin, uh, kind of guy that if you had to pick someone to be stuck in a foxhole with during a, a battle, Bruce would be a pretty good choice. Called me on the phone one day, which he was calling everybody. John, John, I, I saw a lady slipper. I got a lady slipper, and better than that, a hemlock seedling. Uh, you know, it's you know, you can't make this stuff up. And yet people would stand there who were opposed to it. We set up a bunch of exclosures and they'd stand there looking at the incredible diversity with the lady slippers and the hemlock inside the exclosures and nothing but barberry outside. It's got to be something else. It can't be deer. You just want to grab them by the lapels and, yes, it is deer. It doesn't, it's not anything more than that. Okay? So, you don't need any other stressors, but look, now we have climate change. Whose idea was this? Right? This is what I'd like to know. You know, I just want to coast into retirement, you know, and, and I mean, this is, this is uh, sort of in, insanity, right? And how does this interact with all those other stressors that we've already talked about, all right? Uh, this graphic, both of which these I borrowed from the uh, U.S. Forest Service, this one just says it, says it all, <laughs> okay? You know, we're, we're out of time. Uh, and I don't claim to have, you know, any complete answers, but there is just no denying this, um, that it, it is time for some very serious very serious action. Under the current climate change, you're all familiar with these trends, okay? Spruce fir, we talked about before, even though it's recovering because of the uh, improvements in, in, the, uh, in acid rain, um, it's still, in the long run, not, not secure. We're supposed to have a lot more oak and hickory, excuse me, and a lot less maple, beech, and birch. Anybody out here who's a sugar producer, 
I don't, I don't have to tell you about the impacts that this uh, that this is going to have. Okay, so Massachusetts is it's just some summary statistics here, which have already been covered. Okay, no news to anyone, but this is not going away. Okay, we need to talk about monitoring. What monitoring do we do to determine if we're successfully managing in the face of all these stressors? And you're going to tell me right now, if you would, and we'll see if this will work, can you get your phones out and go to menti? Dot com. The first question is, if you could only monitor one thing, and we're talking about forest management primarily, if you could only monitor one thing, what would it be? All right, and I will tell you that I, I'm looking for something here that I would never thought of monitoring 30 years ago, but that more and more we're sort of coming to think maybe is what we need to put a lot more focus on. All right, I'm going to now try to go to the next question. Uh, what's going to really be most impacted under climate change? This is, I think, really is what the major concerns, uh, well, it, everything is, uh, uh, all of these are our concerns. All right. Try not to laugh, but multiple choice. You can only choose one. This should this we're, I'm I'm old. Man, I'm old. Damn. Okay. Alright. Uh, those of you who are not born yet? You know, you know what Earth Day is, <laughs> okay? Uh, all right, we're going to come back to this, but there's a, there's a reason for this madness. So you've told me what you think should be doing for monitoring. What are we doing, okay? And it's evolving. We certainly do a lot of vegetation monitoring, both stratified and subjective. We, we value uh, what, the, what the breeding birds uh, tell us, but here's the one that I am increasingly coming to, is what about pollinating insects, all right? Because if they're not out there in the woods, then, you know, we're not going to see the lady slippers and the hemlock seedlings and that, that sort of thing, and this is something I... When I st st started in this business, couldn't have cared less about pollinating insects. Why do we look at vernal pools to make sure that they're uh, continuing to be productive? Well, because salamanders and uh, you know fairy shrimp and all that are pretty pretty sensitive, like they're like me, very fragile. Okay, and uh, if they're still going, then you know maybe we're all right. And then of course we need to monitor carbon. Uh, I w I'm not going to spend, because uh, I'm getting short on time, uh, I'm, not gonna, I'm just going to sort of fly through this. Vegetation, of course, we want to we, we do a lot of monitoring on, and um, this is how we go about it. It's, you know, we don't need to get into the details, okay? We do some very uh, uh, stratified and very formal vegetation monitoring. Okay, this is what the data sheet looks like. And this is at our primary, our major featured sites. We don't do this formally everywhere, all right? Um, so you lay out these transects, you do your monitoring, then you come back and do a, 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 central, uh, a central plot looking at uh, ground cover of herbs, shrubs, and, and overstory trees. With uh, that data, You've got a good, good, good feel for species occurrence and abundance. And with that in hand, this is my favorite part, <clears throat> then you go out and start wandering a bit, okay? Get to all different parts of your proposed treatment area, right? And 
this is something that I have never done until now. Mapping observed concentrations. We all, we've always taken uh, the success of forest regeneration for granted because, hey, you stop mowing your lawn, 10 years later you've got a forest, okay? But under climate change, I don't think it's so, that's it, such a wise, wise move anymore. So this is really the, the crux of it here. Forgive my cartoon illustrations, but I think we need to do a lot more intensive mapping of advanced regeneration. Use that to set up your retention groups, your skid roads, all that type of thing. All right, with the yellow is northern hardwood, little, little bunches of sugar maple regeneration. So you put a retention group on the south side. You keep the skid trails out of these pockets of, of uh, advanced regeneration. I mean, hey, we all know the skidder operators never stray from the skid trails, right? Yeah. If you believe that, then you know I've got hair like like Donald Trump. But um, I really think we need to, to do a lot more mapping, and that when people are in the cabs of the skidders, the whole tree harvesters, they've got a GPS screen right in front of them, and they can see there's the sugar maple regeneration. There's the oak regeneration, there's this, there's that, and that's why I have to be careful, all right? Okay, uh, we'll just, again, uh, we're out of time, so I'm gonna advance through this. Um, I want you to think, if you haven't before, about monitoring for pollinating insects. This is really just, um, just critical stuff, uh, including one of our sites, Montague Plains, a pitch pine scrub oak site, where um, we still don't know for sure, but it looks like a, a new uh, native pollinating bee species has, has, has been discovered, okay? All right, so this is the end. Uh, carbon, it's the last item. This is where um, I think we all should be monitoring our lands so we can tell people what our carbon budget is, all right? So you can just read, read through Yes, it's based on an initial inventory done in 2006, and then what's happened since then with acquisitions and growth, okay? And the bottom line is we do release carbon through management for rare and uh, declining species. And we feel it's uh, the trade-off is well worth it. This is just a, a, a graphic of the, the average carbon storage per acre across state wildlife lands over time. This sorts it out between carbon that was there when we bought the land, carbon that's been obtained through growth since we bought it, and that little red line at the top is the All right. So there's your, your take home, is that uh, the ratio of release to growth is 17 to one. For every pound of carbon we release, we grow 17 pounds, all right. And so we feel we're doing our, we're, we're doing our part. Uh, I was gonna, prescribed fire is not in this yet. I wanna get to just one last one. Uh, we, we, have to, we, we, have to, we know we have to determine what um, the effects of, of, uh, uh, of fire, okay? So the one I wanna get to is back here. We saw this before. This gets back to my last, my last question. Where did we lose control, all right? You know, up and down through time. This is starting to get bad. Oh, but it's went down again somewhere in here, sort of like where's the point of no return, it's so, so it speaks. I find it incredibly ironic <laughs> that about the time, the first Earth Day, and by the way, I answered that I was at the, the was in junior high school and uh, was at the first Earth Day celebration. It was such a um, a feel-good moment. Oh, we, we got we're gonna do this. You know, we're, we're gonna solve everything. All right. And it, there wasn't that much to feel good about then. 1968 was barely in the rearview mirror. Vietnam War was um, anyway. And here we are half a century later. So um, I just want to encourage you to uh, think about taking part in the 50th 
anniversary of Earth Day this coming April, not only think about participating, but think about what you need to do to really make it count. Because we're out of time. You know, we, uh, uh, it's, uh, we have to take some dramatic uh, actions and uh, we have to convince our political leaders that the time is now, period. All right, thanks. other people in here in, the, in this room that have also been on acid rain research. Um, but that was in 1980 as well. And we put all our attention into the pollutants of sulfur and nitrogen, acidifying components. But you know what? It would have been so easy to put the same into carbon. And we didn't know. Nobody in the research community really put any attention into that. But you know who did know? Mobil, Exxon. And it yanks my chain so much because I was out on the road almost every day putting the sermon on how we need to cut sulfur and nitrogen, sulfur and nitrogen. And it was so easy, but you know what? Carbon was not hurting our lakes. It was hurting the oceans. And it, I just had to add you to that little bit of mm -hmm. that. So, and, but I did have a quick question. You guys undergo a massive amount of monitoring compared to other states on your state wildlife lands. And the re review procedure is just amazing, I, I think. And you mentioned something that's extremely sensitive in Vermont, other than your, in Massachusetts, in Vermont, other than yourself, um, <laughs> is the vernal pools. And we did a, a, a large study in Vermont. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to follow up anymore, but can you just say exactly what uh, you do in the, for those vernal pools once you come across them? Do you just avoid them, or do you actually do monitoring okay, good. of those? Yeah, good. And waters in general when you come to them? Sure. We, we, the short answer is we specifically look for, for, vernal, for vernal pools. Um, we document and certify all the pools that we come across on our managed sites. We typically bu buffer them, OK? and. Um, the heritage ecologists are there in the spring to determine which species of salamanders are, are breeding, are the fairy shrimp completing their, their life cycle, that kind of thing. Do we monitor every vernal pool? No. Okay, there's thousands of them. But you've got to know where they are. You've got to avoid them. The mapping, the, the, the pre-management mapping, okay? Keep the skitter driver the hell out of the pool, all right? You know, that, that, that kind of thing, because they do not. They do stray from the skid trail. All right. Next question. Let me just pass the microphone around. Yeah, you know, one thing you said struck me when you mentioned briefly about uh, skidder operators having uh, GPS on their machines and how the, they could then therefore stay out of certain areas. Have you considered creating an app which you could give free to forest managers and skidder operators uh, now in Vermont, unfortunately? this stuff wouldn't work in 50 or 60 percent of the area where we work because we just don't have coverage. Uh, but if you created an app, you could make a point of asking them to identify these areas and that would, at the same time, make them aware of them. And I think you'd get the cross benefit. Yeah, I, uh, short answer is no, I have not. I know what an app is. I have a concept of it. But <laughs> I have no apps on my phone. I don't know how to use them. But I, we got, I got smart people working for me. And I think it's, you know, it's, it's, you're right. It's, it's, it's what we need. We need a, 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 maybe a series of, of apps. They don't exist yet, but. Mm -hmm. 
one one quick tidbit I, I can't resist the, your point about the operators themselves being a help um, that the Francis Crane WMA you had the pollinator chart up, up there uh, massive amounts of grassland expansion pitch pine scrub oak restoration uh, Eastern box turtle the heritage people require us to monitor before and during and the person who found the most box turtles was the skitter operator because he was looking for them. <laughs>